Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? That's a great start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my job uh, is to talk to you, and I think by extension your job is to listen. However, if you finish your job before I finish mine, can you snore slightly quietly so as not to disturb those who are about to finish uh, or finish on time with me? Now, I am, uh, I am privileged to be here. Um, I was asked to come and give uh, a keynote speech uh, to you on this conference, but the more I looked at the challenge, the more I realised that it would not do justice to your programme simply to turn up and do something generic. So I really felt I had to take the time and make the effort to understand your DNA, your psyche. And I think I've come away over the three days I've been engaged with you and with multiple conversations, and some from Sierra Leone last week, uh, to understand the complexity of the challenge and also to relate to you a sense that there seems to be an eerie calm at the moment in advance of this tsunami of change about to wash over you. And it's curious that we're in a situation where the government has made a broad statement, the, net, uh, the network team is working to try and interpret that, but Sport England is still to deliberate and give its verdict on how it will meet its remit. But uh, this is not a perfect world, and ideally the conference would have been timed, so all those three elements were in place. But it's going to be an interesting year, and I do hope that I can come back next year as a, to sit in the audience there and see what happened, because I think the next 12 months is going to be pretty incredible. I also believe that the challenge facing the CSPs in delivering what the government expects is a big one, and I think you recognise that. And what I'm going to try and do is explore, if you like, in broad terms and in some detail, what I have picked up. Now, everybody's uh, started their presentations with a bit of, who am I? Um, for the last three years, I've been building Surf Snowdonia uh, on the site of the former aluminium factory in Dolgarog, which is the world's first artificial inland surfing lagoon. Don't ask me how I got involved. I was asked, I was headhunted, uh, and I'd clearly... Um, shown a degree of, of a bottle and metal and organisational skill in my previous careers. Prior to that, I was the director of the National Railway Museum, yep, and, um, uh, and that, if you like, is an extension uh, of my personal passion for railways. Um, I set up the Sierra Leone National Railway Museum in my spare time when I was the military advisor to the president of Sierra Leone, and that was noticed, and in due course I was asked to go and run museums. I think my crowning glory at York was shipping these two locomotives across the Atlantic, one from Wisconsin and one from Montreal, to take part in an exhibition, completely free. I managed to talk a shipping company into doing it both ways. I managed to talk Canadian National Railways into moving them. I managed to talk Liverpool Docks and Halifax Port Nova Scotia into loading and unloading. And that was about a million quid's worth of support, all free. The fact that I got Prince Charles to be the patron of the project helped. Uh, and in, in advance of uh, the Prince of Wales saying yes, I was mm, stretching it a bit, but making my own luck and suggesting that if you do this for us, I'll make sure you meet the Prince of Wales. So that helped a bit. Thank God, subsequently, he did say yes. But you've heard about uh, the fact that I, I was in the army. I had 33 years in the army. Uh, I joined uh, the army at the tender age of 16. Uh, with virtually no academic qualification, from the sort of rough end of the trench, as Blackadder would call it. I'm from Darwin, uh, and um, was born in a place called Willow Street, which is rather like Coronation Street, bolted onto the south face of the Eiger. Um, I was clearly deemed too dangerous in the ranks, so the army commissioned me as an officer at the tender age of 18 to ensure I couldn't do any damage. And then I was commissioned into the Queen's Lancashire Regiment, well done, checks in the post, but not as loud as I anticipated. We'll try again later, thank you. Um, drifted up the officer ranks, um, a lot of operational tours, uh, quite a few gongs up here. Uh, became the commanding officer of the Queen's Lancashire Regiment. Then after that, um, it got involved in training a QAT Armour Brigade. And after that, uh, I was promoted to Colonel, went to Sierra Leone to be the military advisor of the President, and after that, ran uh, a division, so I was responsible for the northern half of the UK. 
But then the invitation to run museums came along. Before I go any further, I just want to share with you a degree of inspiration which is absolutely relevant to this event. <clears throat> I took that photograph last week. I've just been in Sierra Leone. I'm president of a charity which supports uh, an endeavour in Sierra Leone, and I've still got some team members out there. But Sierra Leone has come out of a pretty brutal war, and it's the second poorest country in the world, and the, um, the, the likelihood of death at birth is before your 40th birthday. So there's not a lot going for them. But there is one thing that binds them together. On a religious basis, they are 50-50 Christian and Muslim. And if you could bottle that religious harmony and sell it abroad, you would make a fortune because it's the one place in the world I've been to where it is totally and utterly irrelevant. Even the Civil War was not fought on religious lines. But the religion that transcends the former religions is sport and especially football. Now, haven't these people suffered enough? But um, <laughs> I was following that down Kissy Road last week and you'll see the white bus on the right. So I allowed the white bus out and you couldn't make it up. That was on the back of the white bus. <clears throat> now, a lot of people like team sports uh, and football is a massive passion and it allows people to break away from the chaos of, of, of their everyday lives. Not surprisingly, the big, big clubs have a following, United, Liverpool, and so on. But by goodness, in the city of Bow, there is now a Leicester supporters club. <laughs> Johnny come late, Liz, and Leicester's doing fantastically well. Uh, some people prefer not to involve themselves in team sports, but to go uh, freelance. And uh, I took that photograph last week at a party. How on earth he managed that, I have no idea. But the cathedral to this religion is that stadium, the Shaka, stadium, Shaka Stevens Stadium, uh, and a significant amount of public money, which they genuinely cannot really afford, but goes into keeping that place in good order. Uh, that is almost like the Colosseum of Sierra Leone, the places where, where, where Caesar kept the locals happy. And as long as that's in great condition, the public are very, very happy. If you're commercially minded, there are some great opportunities out there. <laughs> OK, let, let, let's get on with the show, uh, as they say. <clears throat> um, this is what I'm going to try and do. Uh, and I've got half an hour, and the watch is ticking away there in good military fashion. I'll just occasionally look down there. But I don't believe that I can really focus on assisting you, the CSPs, unless I've done a little bit of work about the strategic context. Because... Although at the coalface you want just to get on with it, if you are really, really, really savvy, particularly in terms of your commu communications and promotion, you can have a direct influence on what ministers think about what's being delivered at the front line. And I'll expand on that in a minute. What I also want to do is to do a bit of what the army would call mission analysis. And, and, and I've happened upon an interesting aspect uh, of what you are doing, and, and that is how do we connect a minister in the ivory tower in Whitehall with the lad playing football or, or the girl doing gymnastics at your level? And that's an important thing we've got to bear in mind, because if we're going to survive in this big new world, we've got to think bigger and bigger, and try not to be living in a bubble which is driven entirely by your uh, local authority or whatever. Now, as I go through all this, I do recognise that your funding streams are not entirely from Sport England, and that I, I'm told that roughly 70-30% in favour of Sport England, others have that. So you do have other funding sources. But I think the principle holds good, as I go through my analysis of your relationship with Sport England, I think the principle holds good even for the alternative funding suppliers. Now, we're going to look at a case study, and the case study, not surprisingly, is Surf Snedonia. And the reason for that is that in that three years, I reckon that in microcosm, I faced quite a lot of the day-to-day -day challenges to produce something really spectacular that you're going to face, and, and face probably on a daily basis, but it's about to writ large uh, in the new era, and I want to bring out some lessons from that. And then finally, because we all like 
specific practical advice. I'm going to offer you some nuggets and, and tricks of the trade, and I'm going to finish off uh, looking at some advice on how to lead you towards this new revolution. Now, it's worth just briefly reminding yourself of the CSP network mission. <clears throat> Not with any sense that the uh, second line there it has changed, but what I've sought to do there is summarise underneath the, the, the key outputs and also at the bottom, uh, just to alert you, and, and I'm sure you are alert to it, the vast quantity of paper and detail that quite necessarily backs up a project like this. You probably get fed up with yet another envelope arriving from somebody with a tome that thick, with huge amounts of management speak and, and, and business diatribe and so on. It is absolutely essential, and the real, in the real world, of course, uh, the bulk of you are directly accountable to taxpayers, and so those rules have to be followed. And CSB Network has to have a framework around which it delivers this. But the big challenge with all of that, if you like, that massive forest uh, of material is how the hell do you see the wood for the trees? <clears throat> so I'm going to address some of these issues. That first one is pretty critical. In the face of all this busyness, how do we keep really focused on what matters? And throughout this entire process, this, this panoply of UK structure, the most important thing, and we mustn't forget it, is the delivery of a sporting or physical activity to an individual in your towns and constituencies. Process is process. Don't become hidebound by process. Always come back to what you're trying to achieve. Now, the second one, I alluded to this at the very beginning, is that when a minister comes up with a proclamation, quite often, by the time it gets down to the front line, the, the, the message is distilled, distorted, and is in such a language that actually what it doesn't do is resonate with those at the local. It might work at, at ministerial level, but it doesn't, uh, uh, and with Sir Humphrey Appleby, but it doesn't necessarily chime with those at the front line. And I want to look at some analysis in a second about how I think we can overcome that. The, this issue about connectivity between ministers uh, and your level is an important one. And there are some communication tricks. We've heard a couple of times over the last few days about how you've got a fantastic story to tell. And you've no point keeping it to yourself. We've got to tell it. But you're not just telling it to the local newspaper. We're going to have to use your local MPs and politicians and become really savvy about getting them directly accessing your message to government. And finally, though, we'll look at is how do we develop the skills required to, to take you forward? Now, everyone's talking in terms of the future. The reality is the future is about to happen, and at some stage you'll get more detail. But this is also relevant to your day-to-day -day job now. Lift it, you can't lift your game on the day you're supposed to play the match. We've got to start lifting that game now, so we've got a really good control glide path to the point at which the new structures have to be implemented. Now, this was my point of inspiration. Um, you've probably just looked at this. I hope you've seen it. Um, there was the press release from DCMS, and then Tracy Couch put those two paragraphs in. I have no doubt that an official wrote it, but my own experience of two um, uh, appointments in the Ministry of Defence, so I, I'm a bit of a military Whitehall warrior, is that the minister will have read that very carefully, will not simply rubber stamp it. Now, <clears throat> if you're a general on a battlefield, you don't win a battle by saying to the men, this is my business plan for winning the war. You inspire people, and you do that through prose. And there's a military discipline, which is in the orders, there's a mission paragraph. And the next thing is called concept of operations. And the commander personally writes it, because what it does is it conveys the, person, the personality of the boss, if you like, onto that document. He can't write the whole thing, but it conveys that. And when I looked at this, I thought, my God, there's a concept of ops there. <laughs> so I then looked at this, and what's called mission analysis kicks in here. I have highlighted 
the key areas of that statement. And I'm delighted to say that if, even without the Sport England input at this stage, the network is already heading in this direction. So what you have got here is a quotable link. So if you are engaged with senior politicians and others, because the politicians at the top are not involved in the detail of CSB Network's work, but they remember that, you hope, always construct any discussions or reports back to ministers and politicians against those red highlighted areas. Because that's what they want you to do, and you can demonstrate that the message has not been lost on the way down. And I think that's a really critically important piece. Um, I see one or two people taking photographs. Are the slides going to be made available afterwards? Okay, so you will get a, a copy of the slides uh, later. The other issue, before I get on to the detail, is <clears throat> you cannot survive unless you help others to achieve their objectives. And you'll make more friends in the process. If your position is, I'm only interested in what I've got to do, rather than saying, as a secondary question, well, how do I help the board to do what they're trying to do? How do I help that minister do what he want, wants to do? And everyone's got different needs. National politics, if you're a cynic, is all about getting re-elected. If you're not a cynic, it's about a genuine desire to improve the health of the nation. And if that is their genuine objective, this is one of the most exciting times in your history as members of this august body. Because government, for the first time, has stamped this idea that a multi-agency approach to this is important. But let's be clear, although it's sport and physical activity, the public will always focus on sport because that's the tangible thing that they see. So be in a position to be able to help a minister and report back, if you like, um, against that previous slide that I showed you. The ministerial element, of course, is those who enact government policy. And ministers um, clearly will have one eye uh, on keeping the prime minister happy and one eye on delivering things. Now, in my experience, ministers come to a portfolio with little or zero experience of the subject. That is not a bad thing. Um, in, in the last 30 years, no Secretary of State for Defence has ever had any military experience. It, it's just, that's just the way it is. But they bring a completely fresh pair of eyes, so don't be cynical about ministers. The civil service is, needs different handling. The civil service are a constant. Ministers come and go. So what you can't afford to do is to alienate civil servants by um, seeking to try and separate ministers from them. Because if there's a reshuffle, you've got a new minister, but the same civil servants are still there. And it's my experience also that although they get, are maligned and sometimes get a bad press, the civil service of this country, and I've experienced others across the world which are completely incompetent in some areas, the civil service of this country does a good and thorough job. Sport England is probably your most important ally. Uh, and it, it goes without saying that you are almost constantly going to be looking at the, their needs. Clearly, the board is important. And you have to, when you look at the needs of the board, look at the challenge the board faces in that it has no financial control over the CSPs. It doesn't have the levers of power. The funding for CSPs comes around them from Sport England and from your other sources. So the board has a, a really impressive task ahead of it, and currently, which is to exercise intelligence and massive coordination and influence. And hopefully the review may well give them some more levers of power, but we watch out for that. So have some sympathy for the challenges facing the board and indeed the core team. Now, the individual CSPs, we're coming back to it now, you are at the front line to use a military parlance. Uh, and this is, entire thing can only be judged against your performance. And I summarise it like that. The reality is that the first block is there only to support you. Process does not equal productivity. Sporting activity and physical activity is productivity. 
And therefore, the focus has got to be on the CSPs and helping them to deliver not just good, but great. So let's, let's now have a look at um, how, how, do we, how, do we, how do we lift it? How do we raise that game? What do, what do we do now to make this a reality? Well, I'm, I, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, if you like, be my personal motto. Think big and make your own luck. Don't leave anything to chance. Um, long ago, the army stopped fighting attritional battles in which the objective was to last longer than your opponent. The, the, you know, First World War-esque. The army is now much more what it calls manoeuvrist. It promotes an intelligent approach that, that attack the enemy's mind rather than physically. Convince him he's beaten before you actually have to engage him. And you can do that in a number of ways. Uh, and you should have what I call a manoeuvrist mentality uh, in, in everyday life, uh, particularly in the CSPs. Never accept no. Never accept no. Always find a yes, but do it in an intelligent way. Now, this is the Dolgarog aluminium factory, as it was, in the village of Dolgarog in, River, in the Conway Valley. It, is, uh, it had 100 years of um, aluminium smelting, and um, the company I was part of uh, bought it from the receivers, and we decided to turn it into an in, uh, a surfing lagoon using the wave garden technology. Challenge number one, 100 years of aluminium contamination. Challenge number two, a floodplain. Challenge number three, a triple SI next door. And challenge number four, the River Conway just behind it uh, with, uh, during construction, the danger of contaminating it. So mo most developers would run away with just one of those challenges. <clears throat> I put that star there uh, because the next um, slide shows the finished product or virtually finished and I put that star as a reference point and the next slide will show you uh, where that was and that is the same scene today. <clears throat> now in three short years um, we sat down with a blank sheet of paper, worked out a set of principles and realised from the outset that this would not move forward unless we made very very big friends. It was in Wales, so our principal point of contact was the Welsh Government. And very early on, I managed to get a lady called Edwina Hart, who is a very impressive, very senior politician in Welsh Government, to pay an informal visit on the back of attending the Labour Party conference in Llandidno. And I got wind that she was coming up. So by virtue of pestering her staff, um, she agreed to pop in. And that paid huge dividends because she immediately got it. We then had to make lots of friends with local authorities, with Natural Resources Wales and so on. We had to spend a fortune on site investigation. Um, and dealing with the Spanish had its challenges. In terms of the manoeuvrist approach, <clears throat> I did recognise at one point though that I was getting nowhere in my efforts to engage with the First Minister of Wales, uh, Mr Carwin Jones. And I, I, I didn't feel comfortable until I had the full deck, all aware and all supportive. And I thought, how do I do this? So the light bulb came on and I made contact with the president of the International Surfing Association in California um, and uh, Mr. Fernando Inigeth. And I said, Fernando, is there any chance of you writing a letter to the first minister extolling the virtues for world surfing of this thing in Dolgarog. Steve, send me a draft letter and I'll send it. I'm pressing send now. I'd already prepared it, off it went. Two weeks later, I got a very excited phone call from the First Minister's office. Is that Mr Davis? Yes, it is. It's the First Minister's office here. Really? We've had this amazing letter from America to the First Minister and the First Minister would like to come and visit. And would you like a copy? I'd be delighted to have a copy. This is absolutely wonderful. So the First Minister came. Chatham House rules here, folks. Uh, the um, uh, First Minister came and then we had the full deck and it was, all, it was full steam ahead from that point onwards. Now, in terms of delivering the, 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 the concept, we knew from the outset that we couldn't afford for this place to become a narrowly focused surface paradise. It had to have broad appeal. Uh, and we looked at many ways in which 
we could make this broadly uh, a broad appeal. And, and we worked on different markets. We worked on training. We worked on intermediates. We looked at how, and this was a really important thing to me, how could we engage an audience that had no intention of surfing? And then I looked at the circumference of the uh, lagoon. It's 705 metres. We built a path around it, and I suddenly thought, we've got to encourage people to use this as a, as a walk. And I jokingly said to my chairman, we will measure success this project when coach parties of pensioners come here for Sunday lunch and to have a walk to feel part of the experience. And it is a visually amazing experience, this. And that is exactly what happened. We uh, had a, a, a quick win. We've been courting uh, potential big hitters. And I hit the jackpot when I managed to talk Red Bull into holding the world's first international surfing championships inland at this site. Uh, and um, you couldn't buy that. So the key thing here was focusing on the broadest possible market, looking at uh, the way we could help in a charitable way, looking at local schools, looking at local providers, and being as imaginative as we could in not just providing a surfing experience, uh, but also what I call low skill stuff. And if you're not aware of what that is, that's called blobbing. Don't ask me how we got our insurance for it, but it got past the insurance and it is quite an amazing experience. So in microcosm, there was a brand new concept, a blank sheet of paper, uh, and the delivery of this thing really focused on engagement with a broad number of audiences and the repeat visitation as a result of that was spectacular. It's a serious challenge running it. Uh, you need a lot of water. And fortunately, next door, we've got a hydroelectric plant. And I managed to come up with a deal where I gave some land to the hydro plant in exchange for free water forever, which comes directly out of the turbines straight into the lagoon. So we're on the probably the last 10 minutes of our journey here. <clears throat> and I want to move on now to preparing you uh, and some tricks of the trade. <clears throat> now, this, this, does, this goes without saying, but it has to be said. Um, you need to have in your possessions the longest, most exhaustive, non-exhaustive list as possible of people of influence and come up with a systematic engagement process, formal and informal, and also monitor when was the last time we spoke to them. Are they still our friends? Let's send them a little message to remind them that we still exist. Let's bring them in for a briefing. And clearly it has to be focused and they have to be related to what you are doing. But I tell you, when you do your first list, it won't be enough. You'll be able to double it and triple it. And it takes effort, I recognise that, and it takes staff horsepower to achieve it. But in overall terms, what it will do is start to make you a visible entity as opposed to a department within a, a, another organisation. That's important. When it's all going pear-shaped and the in-tray's up here and nothing's going into the out-tray, and the IT's collapsing and you're being asked to produce yet another financial return, it is too easy to lose sight of the outcomes. So you've got to get yourself to a position where you can just occasionally stand back and review those big outputs. Some outputs are, are going to be predetermined by uh, the network. Uh, others, though, extract from that statement by the uh, minister. Now, there are all sorts of fancy uh, success measurement devices being sort of developed out there, and those who develop them will tell you that they will tell you within a, a nanosecond who did what, and within one person how many million took part in this, do not solely rely on them. <clears throat> the danger of some of these targets is that when journalists get hold of them, they grill you as to why you only got 999,999 engaged instead of that million, and prove it. So, you, so you, it's tasting it and feeling it is as important as counting it. And you need to establish, and I'm sure you already do, what I call intelligence gathering points, the local police. What's the incidence of crime on the streets? What's going on in the A&E department? What's the truancy rates in the school? 
Now, all that information exists, but what it does is it provides you, it's like the seaweed hanging outside your house, or the acorn, giving you a sort of, uh, what I call a, a gross, a, 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 a coarse grain view of what's going on. So develop, if you like, your own intelligence network for them to feed in. Doesn't necessarily mean that success in their areas is directly attributable to, to you, but you're probably making a contribution, and that's important. And that is an extension of that same point. It's trends as well as numbers. Um, you'll, you'll be able to taste it, you'll be able to feel it, uh, and instinct is an important thing, as is personality. You know, you've got to stamp your personality all over this, um, but instinct is a powerful thing. And in my experience, when I've ignored my instincts, I've come a cropper. So trust your instincts, and your instincts will tell you as well if it's going well or not. The great thing about a trend is it can't be disproved by the press. But figures can be challenged. Now, one of the roles, as I understand it, of, of, of the network is to try and create some common framework around which you should um, operate and, and adopt. That includes financial best practice, organisational, and obviously taking the opportunity to rationalise with neighbouring CSPs on a local basis where that is possible. What it is not is about suppressing local character. <clears throat> if you lined up 20 infantry battalions on a square, parade square, they'd all look the same to you, because they're all in camouflage. The fact of the matter is they're all 20 different organisations because we recruit based on geography. But what binds them together is a common doctrine and a common operating process, and the army promotes the differences because soldiers fight better when there's a degree of rivalry on the battlefield. That might sound an odd thing. Equally, soldiers do fight uh, for queen and country, but fundamentally they fight for less lofty ideals such as their friends around them and the team that's around them. And this is why um, amalgamation regiments is such a painful process. When a regiment is merged, it is as bloody as would be the merger of Manchester United and Liverpool. Uh, and I'll just leave you with that thought. Now, this is really important. <clears throat> the government, and the Chancellor's about to take the axe again to, uh, I'm sure, the public finances. The trend I think we've all got to recognise is that the public purse is going to get tighter and tighter. The pressure will be on you to reduce your... Um, uh, reliance on Sport England uh, and the money coming from the public purse. Now that is a general observation, uh, but if you're putting a wet finger out of the window, that's probably a trend that you're going to be asked to go down. So you're going to have to be A, better at using your existing money, and B, if you can, find additional sources of money. But entrepreneurship is not just about making money or bringing money in. It's about really energising the programmes that you are developing. This is an important area. And I, can't, I don't believe that every local authority will have a common view on it. But aversion to risk stifles initiative. Uh, and the immediate reaction of, we can't do that because that rule says this and that rule says that, and then going no further is wrong. The rule, that rule may say you can't do this, and that rule might say you can't do that. But then look at ways in which you can do it. Equally, make sure that the culture between you and your board, and it's axiomatic that your board needs to be absolutely razor sharp, uh, that that culture of, of sharing risk is an important one. And if there is one key discipline that has to be honed to a fine edge between the executive and the board, it's a common understanding of risk taking. Number one, that presupposes you've all de determined the direction of travel. My final point on, on this element is over communicate upwards. <laughs> um, if you are constantly, but not too much, you need to judge it right, if you're constantly feeding back, you'll get less questions pestering you coming down. Equally, 
make sure that you don't use just the traditional channels to get your good message. Go to your local MP, MPs. Brief them regularly. Make sure that the local heads of Chambers of Commerce and others are kept in the loop. Specifically ask your MPs and local politicians to directly engage with the minister next time they bump into them in the corridors of power uh, in, the, in the House of Commons. Um, my wife's cousin is a guy called Tim Farron, who is leader of the Liberal Democrat Party, and just occasionally I'll try and wing in via him. Doesn't work very often because our politics are very different. But my point is this, don't look simply to what I call the communication channels that you are traditionally used to. Be a bit savvy and make friends. And that message, nine times ten, might not get there. But if you keep at it and keep at it, your good news will coalesce with everybody else's good news at the very top. And ministers will then get a warm glow. There's nothing better for a minister than a constituency MP to come up to him saying, you know that initiative of your department, yeah? Well, it's having an effect in my constituency and I'm really pleased. There is a psyche uh, and you need to recognise it. Finally, let's just look briefly at leadership tools. Uh, I do a lot of, a lot of this and, and I've dealt, developed my own ideas but, uh, about leadership, but <clears throat> it's clear from the outset that there is a massive difference between management and leadership. Management is the science, not the art, of using resources to have an effect. And theoretically, there is a limit to that effect using those resources. Leadership is all about getting more out of the model than the management structure would say, suggest is possible. It's all about creating the most incredibly positive atmosphere in your workforce. Making staff loyal to the company because the company is loyal to them. Making them want to come to work in the morning. It's also about using your personal skills and it's not just focused on the one person at the top who is the leader. Because everybody is either in a leadership role at some stage or is a potential future major leader. And equally, all of these tenets are applied to what I call group behaviour so that the organisation itself is more important. You've got to know your people and you've got to be seen, and now that might sound obvious, but you've got to take time to sit down with them as individuals and know one or two facts about their domestic lives, their concerns and so on. The fact that you stop to talk to somebody in a corridor will immediately be communicated around the whole organisation and your leadership skills will, uh, and credibility will rise accordingly. If you're not a master of the subject, um, you're, you're going to fail. And if you don't have a clear vision about the direction of travel, you're going to fail. Because if you haven't got a message, you can't communicate. But recognise that you aren't going to be an expert on everything. And that's why delegation uh, becomes such an important thing. Be seen to be safe. <clears throat> Do not get a reputation for making erratic, illogical decisions particularly in your relationship with the board. Pause and think. Pause and think. Don't fly off the handle and always remain calm. The second you are seen to flap like a chicken, your reputation has gone forever. If you do not delegate, you will find that nothing gets done. Even the, the, the most control freak um, who holds everything together, despite saying do this, it won't happen. The key with delegation is the first point, knowing your people. Understanding how much you can delegate and their capability to absorb the delegated authority. And tell them what to do, but not how to do it. If you, do, if you tell them how to do it, you will suppress a ton of initiative. And nine times out of ten, if you let them get on with it, they will surprise you with the quality of the added value they brought to the problem. Decisions which are arrived at uh, and, rub and stamped and then are subject to yet more discussion is corrosive to group credibility. Clearly, there is debate to be had, but discuss, di uh, discuss decide and then get on with it is an important issue. Uh, and in the future, in a fast-moving environment, you cannot afford to dwell for too long. Clearly, those decisions 
uh, have to be taken over a time frame which is axiomatic with the scale of the problem. Uh, if you've got a long time uh, to discuss, fine. If you've got a very short, instantaneous decision to be made, make it and then stick to it. Do not tolerate, though, carping outside the management group about the decision that's been taken because that is disloyal to your colleagues and it is not good for your group credibility. There'll be times when you have to write mid-year appraisals and end-of-year appraisals uh, and that is sometimes quite difficult. But if you do not have the moral courage to say the right thing and tell somebody honestly and accurately what you think, have it, but it should never come as a surprise, then you are storing up trouble for the future because the danger then is that the wrong people are promoted beyond their capabilities. Equally, make the right decision, not the popular decision. If the two coincide, that's a bonus. Communication is really important, and, and I've laboured this point, but it, you might be an absolute genius, but unless you can convey it both accurately and enthusiastically to take those people with you, you might as well keep it inside yourself. We've covered networking. Be a brilliant networker. Um, it always pays dividends. And that is really important. Um, if you don't pause to stand back and think, then actually events will always overtake you. And it's, a, a, and it's an important discipline sometimes to have a member of staff whose job is to say, we need to stop, we need to back off, let's look at the big picture, and then let's re-engage. Uh, we have to do that uh, all the time in our lives, but knowing when, don't try and fight every single battle. Otherwise, people will not like you and will not come into negotiations in true faith. And finally, um, clearly the board has to be razor sharp, but be friends with the board. Make friends. People do not like the lead up to a board where you know it's going to be adversarial. So don't allow it. Make friends. And if there's got any issues, get them cleared. So... Did we achieve the objective? We've gone through all those points. Um, I believe that in the short period of time, and I could have gone on for hours, um, but in the short period of time, I hope I've conveyed this sense about the strategic positioning, um, the themes that emanate from a minister which are directly relevant to you at your levels. We looked at the case study and about the challenges that we faced and how they parallel what you're doing. And then we looked at some of the practical tricks of the trade. That, though is my most important advice. you are delighted to hear that my answer to the chimpanzee is, I have finished. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time.